Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture. In the last lecture, we studied uh, the basic principle of experimental model analysis. Uh, in this and the uh, next few lectures, we are going to study FRF measurement using impact hammer. And in this particular lecture, we are going to basically talk about excitation of the structure using impact hammer. So the topic today is uh, excitation using an impact hammer. So a brief outline of the lecture is as follows. First we will look at a typical experimental setup that is used for FRF measurement using impact hammer. Uh, then we will see that how FRF is estimated using transient excitation. Okay, because impact hammer basically applies a transient force and a transient response is generated. So how transient uh, you know, ex, uh, force and transient response basically can be used to find a frequency response function. Then we will look at the basic construction of an impact hammer and then at the end we will look at the role of hammer tips in uh, FRF measurement. Uh, so therefore let us first of all look at uh, you know, a typical experimental setup used for uh, FRF measurement using an impact hammer. So, a typical experimental setup for FRF measurement using an impact hammer. Right. Let us look at this. Uh, so let us say we have a structure, uh, something like this. Let us say there is a frame structure. This is the frame we have. The frame is grounded at the bottom, and then we want to perform model testing on this. Uh, so, to measure FRF, we are using impact hammer here. So, we will have hammer like this, right, which will be used for application of the of an impact force and measurement of that force, okay. So, this is the impact hammer and then, uh, then we have an accelerometer like this let us see. So this is used for measurement of response and often an extrometer is used for measurement of response. Uh, the outputs of uh, the hammer and the uh, extrometer they are now passed through charge amplifier. So we have the outputs passing through charge amplifier. Like this. So, therefore, hammer has got a you know force transducer, which is typically a piezoelectric force transducer. This piezoelectric force transducer generates an output you know charge, which is proportional to the force being applied. Okay. So, the output of the hammer is typically a charge signal, and this uh, signal uh, basically needs to be a converted to a voltage signal. Okay. This signal is a high impedance signal, and it needs to be converted to a low impedance signal which basically leads to conversion of the charge signal to voltage signal and this is achieved via charge amplifier. So charge amplifier converts the charge signal into a voltage signal. Uh, so then you after the output of the charge amplifier which is a voltage signal that is then fed to a data equation system or an FFT analyzer. So let us say if we are using an FFT analyzer to measure this voltage signal then we will have, we require at least two channels okay, for measurement because we want to simultaneously measure the force signal as well as the response signal. So we require at least two channels in the data equation system or the FFT analyzer, which one we are using. So 
so it's we require a dual genome measurement so this is the uh, output of the charge amplifier uh, giving us a voltage signal proportional to the force and then we have the output of the charge amplifier which is uh, you know amplifying the output of the accelerometer and giving us a voltage signal proportional to the acceleration like this. So, this effect analyzer uh, basically has got inbuilt functions to uh, process these signals right and one of such functions is the frequency response function ok. So, we can directly you know estimate the frequency response function based on you know this two signals like this like this ok. Um, so, therefore, uh, this is nothing but let us uh, you know put nomenclature here this is the test structure this is impact hammer and this is accelerometer and this is FFT analyzer or it could also be a data equation system any DAQ system right. Uh, now, you know the force transducer used in the in the force uh, in the hammer and accelerometer you know if they are of charge type right that is the output of uh, you know these transducers which are charge signals then we require an external charge amplifier as shown in this you know schematic right for amplification of the signal or conversion of the signal from charge to voltage. Uh, but nowadays you know uh, the sensors which have built in charge amplifiers you know the electronic circuits which performs the conversion of charge signal to voltage signal uh, you know uh, nowadays we have the sensors which have that built in circuitry the sensors themselves are having that circuitry built into them and therefore such sensors are typically you know, they are referred as IEPE sensors or ICP sensors. So, we have IEPE or ICP you know transducers right that is the force transducer and the accelerometer. So, they have you know built in charge amplifiers. Right. So, IEP stands for integrated electronics piezoelectric. So, it is a basically name of the technology uh, right uh, you know for the having a built in charge amplifier and ICP is another you know trade name uh, which basically also indicates sensors with have which have built in charge amplifiers. Um, so, these basically sensors therefore, the, their output would be directly in terms of a proportionate voltage signal right and therefore, uh, the sensitivity of these transducers they are in terms of if it is a force transducer then the sensitivity of these you know transducers will be in terms of uh, millivolts per newton of force right. If it is an accelerometer then the sensitivity of this you know ICP or IEP type accelerometer would be in terms of millivolts per meter per, per, per second square or millivolt per g of excitation 1 g of excitation right. Uh, so, such therefore, such transducers if they are there then we do not require external charge amplifiers right. We can directly feed the output of the sensors to the FFT analyzer, uh, but the sensors they also require uh, you know a, a, some power supply for them to operate because that built in you know charge amplifier requires power electric power. And therefore, the input ends of the FFT analyzer they must be have the capability to supply that electric supply ok electric power uh, otherwise we require a separate source uh, in the form of a signal conditioner which can you know per supply that electric power. So, therefore, when we are using these uh, types of IP or ICP type of sensors uh, we should also ensure that the um, uh, data vision system has the capability to supply you know necessary electric power for the sensors to operate. Uh, 
So therefore, if uh, the sensors they are of charge type, so we have charge type transistors, right? So in that case, the force transistor sensitivity would be in terms of uh, pico coulomb per newton, right? And for accelerometer, the sensitivity will be in terms of pico coulomb per meter per second square or pico coulomb per g of acceleration, one g of acceleration, right? So, in either case, uh, you know, in the effect analyzer, what we get basically are voltage signals which are proportional to the force and excitation signals, right. So, let us try to you know, talk more about what are these signals. So, let us go to the next page. Uh, so, if you look at, let us say, uh, what are the physical signals? Let us try to sketch physical signals here, right. So, the force signal, the force signal will be in terms of we will have a force time history. So, we have the force in terms of newtons and then we have time t here in terms of seconds. So, this force uh, will be in the form of an impact being applied. So, uh, it will be basically a narrow pulse right which is acting on the structure. So, we have the force will be in the form of uh, a narrow pulse like this which is acting on the structure, right. And then we will have similarly for the acceleration, let us say this is the acceleration A in terms of meter per second square as a function of time. So, structure is going to have a transient response, okay. So, the response will build up as the force is applied and then gradually it will decay because the, there is no longer any force acting after the pulse has, you know, elapsed. So, we will have the transient response like this something like this right so this will be the excitation of the structure so these are basically the physical signals now what are the corresponding measured voltage signals in the ff analyzer let us uh, you know write them here measured voltage signals right so, for force signal F, we will have the voltage signal Vf uh, as a function of time, right? That will be available to us. And then for the acceleration, we will have Va voltage signal, right? So, F and A subscripts are used to indicate the force and acceleration. So, these are the voltage signals that will be measured in the FFT. And now, how can we retrieve the you know force and acceleration signals, right? Or how can we convert these voltage signals into engineering units in the signals with engineering units? So, we can also obtain measured signals in terms of engineering units. Okay, and that we can obtain using the sensitivities of the corresponding transistors. So, if you represent a measured signal in engineering units as say f of t, then this would be nothing but v f of t that is the voltage signal corresponding to the force divided by the sensitivity of the force transistor. So, let us say s f is the sensitivity of the force transistor. So, in this way, I will get this signal in terms of newtons, right. Similarly, if I am wish to know what is the acceleration signal which is a of t the signal in the terms of engineering units, then I can divide V A T by the sensitivity of the accelerometer and this would be now in terms of meter per second square, correct. So, we should know that the sensitivity of this S F is in terms of, let us say if we are using the IEP or ICP type of transistors, then in that case uh, the sensitivity S F would be here uh, simply the volts per unit Newton. Right, and since the voltage Vf is in terms of volts, this uh, ratio uses the force in newtons. 
Similarly, this axiometer sensitivity is uh, can be written as in terms of volts per meter per second square. So, in this way you know you can see we obtained a measurement of the uh, force and excitation signals in the FF10 laser. Now, how we uh, obtain the frequency response function from these measurements? So, let us look at FRF measurement or rather FRF estimation uh, okay, based on these signals. So, what we know that we now have a measure of force signal given by f of t and this force signal is a transient force signal, it is a transient force, it is acting for a short duration right and after that there is no force. So, it is a transient force and then it leads to uh, a response excitation a of t which also is transient. So, it is a transient response. Correct, and uh, so therefore transient force leads to transient response. So the question is, how do we find the frequency response function? Uh, uh, in fact, if we recall, uh, we defined the frequency response function, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know the harmonic force being acting on the structure, right? So uh, we said that the frequency response function at value omega basically is nothing but the response of the structure, okay, uh, to a unit amplitude harmonic force. So, fundamentally the frequency response function is defined for harmonic forces of different frequencies. So, how uh, we obtain the frequency response function using transient force and transient response? The transient force and transient response they are not harmonic they are, nor they are periodic right. They are basically aperiodic functions. So, how do we obtain the frequency response function from this? So, here therefore we make use of uh, the Fourier transform which we studied earlier. So, Fourier transform enables to uh, describe the transient signals in the frequency domain right. So, once we go to the frequency domains they again basically are represented as you know sum or collection of uh, different harmonic signals. So, therefore, we take the Fourier transform and that basically gives us a frequency domain description of this transient force let us represent it by f of omega. Similarly, the excitation signal is Fourier transformed which basically uses the frequency domain representation of the excitation signal A of omega. Okay. Uh, so, and let us say that uh, the we on the structure we have applied the force let us say at the uh, kth degree of right we have applied the force at kth degree of freedom and response is being measured at let us say jth degree of freedom right. So, in that case this f of omega we can designate as f k omega okay. that is the force uh, you know at kth degree of freedom. Similarly, the excitation we have measured can be designated as a j omega. So, let us now obtain the frequency response function based on these measurements. Uh, so, since we have the excitation response we will basically estimate the inertance, inertance is based on the excitation response. So, inertance f r f it is given by a j k that is the response excitation response at the j degree of freedom due to force at the k degree of freedom omega. This will be now simply the ratio of a j omega and f k omega right. So, this is basically the uh, uh, you know f r f for uh, between the j th and k degree of freedom. So, this is how the f r f between any two degrees of freedom can be obtained. Let us now look at uh, what is impact hammer and what is basic construction. Okay. So, we are going to now look at impact hammer. So, this impact hammer is not a you know simple hammer, it is an instrumented hammer. Okay. It is an instrumented hammer. 
which means that it has been instrumented to measure the force that is being applied by the hammer. Let us try to sketch a diagram of the impact hammer. Uh, so we have this here like this, this is the hammer head right and then uh, in front of the hammer head we have a force transducer like this okay and then uh, there is a provision to attach what is called as hammer tip here like this okay and then we have um, arrangement to hold the hammer like this so this is the handle right and then we have a output socket here okay so therefore let us uh, name not do the nomenclature this is hammer head right this is handle this is output socket this is force transducer this is hammer tip okay uh, and then there is also uh, some designs have a provision of adding an extender mass here like this so one can add a x mass here like this so this is extender mass So, when the force is applied uh, with the hammer, when the hammer is struck or hit against the structure, uh, the um, you know the force that is being applied is being sensed by the force transducer. Force transducer converts that to a proportionate uh, you know charge signal and if there is a built in charge amplifier, that charge signal is converted to voltage signal and that signal is then carried to the output socket uh, through you know suitable cable. And then by connecting cable at the output socket that force uh, corresponding with that voltage signal can be measured. Uh, now the hammer tip is basically used uh, in order to you know uh, control or change the frequency of excitation that is basically excited by the you know impact okay. And we will talk uh, after this what is the role of hammer tip. Extender mass also can be basically added right to again reduce or change the frequency range of excitation. So, uh, extender mass can be attached at the top or can be removed and that basically helps to again a uh, little bit uh, change the frequency range of excitation. So, these impact hammers are available in different sizes uh, because uh, different structures may require different amount of force for excitation. Small structures may require small amount of force. So, there may there are small hammers which probably can apply force maybe up to say you know 150 to 200 newtons and then there are big size hammers which can be used for big structures like you know steel engine structures you know um, requiring very large amount of force you know like exceeding say uh, 10 to 20 kilo newton right. Uh, so, such hammers are also available. Uh, let us now look at what is the role of hammer tip. So, typically manufacturers provide three or more tips and they are typically we have a rubber tip uh, and plastic tip and then we have uh, say aluminum or metal tip ok. So, what is the role of the this hammer tip ok in the excitation? Uh, to understand that let us first of all look at the rubber tip and see that how uh, what kind of impact it generates and what is the frequency domain you know uh, representation or frequency spectrum of the force that is being applied. So, let us look at rubber tip 
right? And let us try to sketch a, a typical, you know, uh, you know, impact force that is being applied by this tip. So, this is uh, force axis that is force in newtons, right? And then, so let us say this is up to say 400 newtons, right? And then we have, let us say, up to say 8 into 10 to the power minus 3 seconds, right? That is 8000 milliseconds. So, the so if uh, with the rebel tip, the force that may be applied may uh, look something like this, right? This is the you know the force that is being applied, and, and so uh, it's a very narrow you know uh, pulse. Uh, so we should note that it is spanning over say around six thousand you know uh, milliseconds, right? So it's a narrow pulse. Let us now try to see what is the frequency Fourier spectrum of this force signal. So we take the Fourier transform, and now we are going to plot the magnitude of the force in dB as a function of frequency. So we are going to plot, plot magnitude uh, of force in dB, right, versus log omega. Okay, that is on a logarithmic frequency axis, and the reference value used for finding the dB is the force amplitude at uh, omega is equal to 0, right. So, at the 0 frequency whatever is the force amplitude that we use as the reference value to calculate the dB. Uh, so, let us try to sketch the spectrum that would result. So, this is nothing but the magnitude of F in dB and then on this axis we have the frequency right. So, this is say 10 then this is let us say 10 to the power 2, this is 10 to the power 3, this is 10 to the power 4 right. These are the decades of frequency ranges and let us say this is 0 dB here right. Uh, so, now if we plot then uh, this we see that the spectrum looks something like this. something like this right. Uh, so, what we observe? We observe that the there is a main lobe here, this is the main lobe here right and then it is followed by side lobes. Okay, followed by side lobes. Uh, and we see that the uh, main lobe has almost a constant uh, magnitude, right? Uh, though it is not exactly constant because we are plotting on a dB scale. So, mm, therefore, uh, the, there is small change, but it looks almost constant, okay? And then as we go further, the side, side lobes, you know, appear and the amplitude of the side lobes uh, drastically reduces uh, with frequency, okay? Uh, so, therefore, the excitation energy is mainly concentrated in the main lobe and beyond the main lobe, the concentration of the excitation energy is uh, very insignificant and because in that range the excitation energy is insignificant, the response in that frequency range is also very small because of which uh, the signal to noise ratio in that range is also small. Uh, another thing we observe that between every two successive side lobes, there is a frequency where the response is uh, 0. Right, the force may because the force amplitude drops to zero uh, between every two at, at some at some frequency between every two successive side lobes. So at those places, in fact, there is no response, and only the noise in the signal would dominate. So based on these observations, we see that uh, the the effect to frequency range, uh, which can be considered, uh, you know, for FRF estimation, is a range which covers the main lobe. Now to decide the excitation frequency range, we can use a thumb rule. So, the excitation frequency range
is from 0 you know uh, frequency right uh, from 0 uh, radian per second to the frequency where the force amplitude drops by 20 dB. Where the force amplitude drops by 20 dB. So, uh, we can mark this somewhere here. Let us say uh, if it is, this is minus 20, then if we extend this line, then now we can draw an ordinate here. Somewhere. Here. So, therefore, this we can uh, you know consider as the useful uh, frequency range over the structure uh, can be assumed to be have been excited, right? This is the excitation frequency range. Okay. So, beyond this range, though there is some excitation, but that excitation is not adequate enough for making a reliable measurement. Okay, it's very uh, very very small excitation is there. Uh, so in this case, we see that the range could be something like 200 or 250 hertz uh, from this for this particular figure. So rubber tip can be used typically to depending upon the material of the tip, depending upon its dimension, the excitation range could be something like say 250 to 400 hertz, or maybe uh, in that range, right? Let us now see that how the uh, kind of the nature of the tip affects the force profile and its spectrum. So, let us first of all uh, draw the force profile here. So, here we have the force in Newton, we are plotting against the time, okay, and this is let us say the 8 into 10 is to power minus 3 seconds and so for the rubber tip already we had made the plot. So, this is around 400 Newton. So, this is uh, for a typical you know medium size hammer. Uh, so, the this is the rubber tip. Uh, if we use a plastic tip, the we see that the uh, length of the pulse becomes shorter and the uh, amplitude of the pulse becomes larger. Okay. So, this is the force profile due to the plastic tip. Okay. So, this is due to plastic tip and this is due to rubber tip and with a aluminum tip the force profile becomes even more narrower like this. Okay, this is aluminum tip. Okay, so what is the observation? Uh, as the uh, stiffness of the tip increases, right? Because plastic tip has a higher stiffness as compared to rubber tip and aluminum tip even has a more uh, further higher than the plastic tip. So, as uh, tip becomes stiffer, the uh, force pulse becomes narrower. Okay. And the peak force also becomes larger. Now, what is the effect of this on the frequency spectrum and the frequency range of excitation? So, therefore, we take the Fourier transform of all these three you know, pulse signals and let us now try to sketch an overlay of the Fourier spectrums. Okay of these three impact uh, force profiles. So, here we are going to now show the magnitude of the force due to h in dB, 
right? And then uh, we basically uh, use the reference value uh, for each of the you know spectrums, uh, you know, uh, based on the magnitude of the force at zero frequency for the particular tip, right? So reference values are different for uh, each of the three you know profiles. So uh, therefore, finally, we have uh, the uh, all the three curves starting from the zero dB. So this is in dB zero. And then let us say we have this is uh, 10, this is 10 to the power 2, this is 10 to the power 3, and this is 10 to the power 4. This is in omega in radians per second. Uh, okay. And now uh, for the rubber tip, already we had sketched this. Let us try to sketch that again. Uh, so we have. The spectrum like this, like this. So this is the spectrum due to the rubber tip. Uh, now let us try to sketch the spectrum due to plastic tip. So this plastic tip spectrum will be. Let us try to sketch a dotted line. Use a dotted line to sketch this, and this is typically would be something like this. something like this. Let us try to sketch it for the aluminum tip now and this would be like this, right. So this is for rubber tip, this is for plastic tip. And this is for aluminum tip. And let us now try to use our thumb rule uh, to find what is the effective frequency range of excitation. So we try to look at the cutoff frequency or the frequency where the magnitude of the force spectrum drops by 20 dB. So um, if we sketch this line here like this, right? And then, so what we see that this is the basically frequency range by of the rubber tip. So we can call it this as omega rubber. And this is the frequency range range of plastic tip. Right? And this is the frequency range of aluminum tip. So therefore, what we see is that uh, as the uh, pulse becomes narrower, the frequency range becomes larger. Okay, so a stiffer tip uh, will excite a higher frequency range. Okay, a stiffer tip will excite a higher frequency range, and therefore the frequency range excited by the aluminum tip uh, among the three tips is highest. Okay, uh, so we can say that uh, uh, as the as tip becomes stiffer the frequency range of excitation becomes larger uh, so if you let us uh, look at these frequency ranges for a typical hammer commercially available right and which is used for excitation for medium or small size structures then uh, in hertz uh, if i code these values then for rubber tip uh, this is around say 
250 to 400 hertz right and for plastic tip this could be from maybe 2 uh, to 2.5 kilohertz okay and for aluminum tip this could be like say uh, 7 to 7.5 kilohertz so these are just approximate values basically indicating the order of magnitude of the frequency range of excitation uh, right and the specific values uh, you know they depend on the size of the tape the material of the tape right even the stiffness of the structure on which it is hit that will also affect the frequency range okay so all these factors are going to affect the contact stiffness so effectively what is happening is the uh, contact stiffness between the hammer and the structure that basically alters the shape of the force that is being applied frequency range they depend on they vary from hammer to hammer and you know structure to structure uh, so therefore it is a good practice in model testing to first of all look at what is the effect to frequency range one is able to obtain with a given hammer and the tip so one can perform a preliminary excitation and opt look at the force spectrum and from that using for example this thumb rule one can look at what is the frequency range that can be excited so now the question arises that should we use rubber tip at all uh, because aluminum tip has a high, has the highest frequency range of excitation so it will be able to cover cater to most of the situations uh, so the uh, ideally we should use uh, the hammer tip uh, whose frequency range of excitation is just adequate to cater to the frequency range of analysis right uh, using a tip which has a much more higher frequency range of excitation will unnecessarily put uh, a lot of excitation energy in the range which we are not uh, interested to measure okay and therefore the signal level in the useful frequency range or the desired frequency range will be reduced and therefore the signal to noise ratio will not be uh, may not be adequate or enough uh, which will basically adversely affect the quality of our measurement so therefore um, we should try to use that tip which just uh, caters or is adequate to excite the frequency range which we want to measure so in this way today we looked at how uh, excitation can be done using an impact hammer uh, we now stop here. Thank you.